Okay, we're arriving on the second talk of today, of this morning, and we have the pleasure of welcoming Phil Bourne here. So we'll wait until his mic is set up. Thank you. So Phil is at the Department of Pharmacology of the University of California, San Diego, and he's a chemist by training. But, I mean, early on he became a structural biologist. He's now the co-director of PDB for a number of years. He's also the developer of IEDB, the Immune Epitope Database. He was, during his career, co-founder of three companies and is in numerous committees and uh, different honorary uh, positions. And I think, again, we said that, I don't know for which speaker, I think, I mean, uh, that how important the user community I mean, it is for the user community to have people which spend time, I mean, trying to basically lobby for all what, all. so thank you for all of those efforts. And he's the editor in chief of PLOS Computational Biology. Now, as geographical links have put Adelaide, where you actually studied, Sheffield in England, New York, Columbia, and San Diego, where you've been for a number of years. I didn't put a lot of names in bowlings because it would be all of the PDB, MSD crew, all people you interact with, but Ellen Berman, with whom you co-direct PDB, and Ilya Shindialov, with whom I think you've written many papers. It's fair to say that Phil likes speeds both in the air and on long. <laughs> so thank you, Phil. For okay, being here. thank you very much. If any of you ever come to San Diego, I'll be happy to take you flying and frighten you to death. Uh, you do it. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Amos, and thank you ever so much. I add my thanks to everybody else for inviting me here to come and talk a little about uh, the PDB uh, and the RCSB PDB uh, in particular, and I'll get into that in a moment. Um, I also want to make a tribute. It's very interesting that Alex and I just essentially, uh, he's done the same thing and I, I would like to do that too because I think the job that uh, the, the annotators, the biocurators and the programmers and everyone else who supports these databases, uh, I really do think uh, you're somewhat underrepresented and uh, appreciated. And from someone like myself who both maintains resources uh, and actually does research based on those resources. I owe you a huge uh, tribute of thanks, and I thank you uh, immensely for those efforts. I will also say that you know the, these resources are institutions, and at this point's been partly made, and I'll make it strongly. They go way beyond individuals. They're as important as Arctic stations, as synchrotrons, and everything else uh, that are regarded as immutable resources in our scientific community. And uh, we should definitely view databases of biological information in the same way um, and really push to have them recognized as institutions. And as, uh, as such, I and Helen Berman and Kim Henrik at the MSD and Haruki Nakamura at Osaka in Japan are merely the guardians of these institutions uh, as we move forward. I would say as a tribute to the biocurators that we are doing a special issue or a special feature, I should say, uh, in PLOS Computational Biology, which, of course, is an open access journal. And we have some interesting views from biocurators, and I would love to have one from SwissPro. And if you're going to do it, I'd ask you to give it to me in the next month, and uh, we would welcomely publish that. So I'm just, I'm not, partly because my memory is so bad, I can't really do much on history because I don't remember anything. So I can only go forward. So I'll be very brief in, uh, in my description of what's happened in the PDB so far, and then I'll go on and give you a, a perspective, and I say it's a perspective, uh, on how things are going to sort of evolve in the next uh, few years, uh, and, I, um, and I'll leave it at that. So quickly, and a bit of history. So the PDB has been around since 1971, and I would emphasize that it was really founded by the community. And the, the community, and Amos just said this again, that the community is what really drives this resource. And 
uh, that's so important to us. It must reflect the views and the desires of the community. And we've tried to keep that going. Obviously, I uh, think that, you know, I've highlighted a few things here. Number of depositions, this is obviously true of all these resources. We've heard it many times. Uh, I will say something more about that in a second. That's, I wouldn't say peculiar, but certainly particular uh, to protein structure. Uh, and then there's basically uh, Joel Sussman, who was the guardian of the PDB at one point, talked about requiring depositions and their relationship to publication. And I won't say any more about that, but it's very important. And then the ontology. We basically, we, you've heard about ontologies, you'll hear more from Michael. But essentially, this is the underpinning of the PDB, and it's absolutely critical. And it can't be underestimated what kind of effort it takes to produce such a thing. We started this before anyone really, at least in the biological community, was f familiar with the term ontology. And it was supported, and this is very important, by the International Union of Crystallography. So it had support of a major international scientific society. We believed that it would take, it was a whole group of us doing this, we believed it would take a few Sunday afternoons, uh, rainy afternoons, to get this done. It took seven years to get the first release out, uh, but it's absolutely critical. And then, of course, we now have structural genomics, which is high-throughput structure determination that really makes us think again about the pipeline of getting from structures uh, that are being done by experimentalists into the, into the resource itself, into the institution. And then there's this collaborative effort that does all of this through Worldwide PDB, and I'll say a bit more about that. And through all of this, and whatever we do going forward, there's an absolute core mission. And the core mission, of course, is always to deliver data on time and of highest quality that we can muster. And that's definitely been our, uh, our goal. We, right now, data is delivered once per week. We've never failed to deliver on that. We'd have a worldwide community on our back if, if that happened. Um, we may actually go to more frequent distribution, uh, and anyone who's interested, we could talk about that. So what are the challenges? Well, I would say, first of all, more complex structures, and I'll show you that in a moment. New methods, uh, electron microscopy, there are now an increasing number of entries in the protein data bank uh, in the area of electron microscopy. This required extensions to the ontology to actually describe details of the experiment and the resulting data. That was done through community workshops where people actually sat and did this. Uh, you know, they came for a week and they actually developed the ontological terms. They went away. This was added to the resource. Um, and so on. I think a challenge in the future and going forward, because we're getting more complex structures, what we don't have, we have wonderful vocabularies in, for example, CAF and SCOP for describing uh, arrangements of structures at different levels. Well, at the moment, we don't really have anything, a reductionism, that really helps us to describe uh, complex structures and how complex is uh, and oligomeric compounds actually interact. And there are examples of that coming, and hopefully one or more of those will rise to the top and become a, a standard uh, method. It's important. I'd say we have a number of problems that are partially solved. Structure alignments, domain definitions from structure, functional site determination, which we've heard about here from Chris and others, uh, pathway relationships, interacting partners, we're making lots of progress here, but it's work in progress. It's by no means done. And then there's the view of viewing the molecule in the larger context and the smaller context, looking at a protein structure in the context of its gene structure. This is going, in my view, going to be a very important thing going forward, and it's something that we really need to address in a systematic way. And then there's relationships to diseases as an example. And one of the problems you face in any resource is a protein structure is determined, and at that point it's not identified as being associated with a disease. So you constantly have to go back and make those associations. So here's just uh, an example. People have talked about growth rates, but the growth in complexity, all of these molecules are to scale. So basically you can see we've got to way more complex molecules, many new challenges about how, to, as simple as things as how to represent the molecule, to how to fully describe uh, its interactions and so forth. Another aspect of what we're doing and what we've done is data integration. Uh, we've basically taken the approach of warehousing. So now at the moment we have about 40 or 50 loaders where each week 
we actually go and scoop XML files from a whole series of different resources and integrate those into the context of the RCSB PDB. And so the, the advantage of that is, of course, you can query jointly across any of these things. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that it requires quite a lot of update uh, each week to do this. And we may have to revisit that, but that's how it's working currently. And then, of course, there's technical challenges. Uh, there's uh, numbers of obvious, but efficient visualization. For any of you who have tried to view some of the largest molecules in the PDB with the current generation of molecular viewers, will know that in many cases there are problems. There's also problems, for example, looking at things in different scales. So if you want to look at a model within an electron density map or in some, uh, in some EM data, there's, there aren't that many tools that really allow you to do that. Improved annotation, we've heard a lot, a bit about, a lot about that, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and then there are demands for a more diverse user base. The notion of having a centralized versus decentralized uh, environment. And then there's the notion of web version 2, or the semantic web, and what that brings forth. And I'll describe to you a little about what we're doing you know, in that regard. So right now, we have about 180,000 individual users use the RCSB PDB each month. So that's like two large football stadiums of people, and they come from every walk of life. And so what we've done is to characterize those communities according to six different groups right now. And we're actually specifically targeting trying to work within those communities. And I'll say a little more about that. So that's really what I'm going to say about the past uh, and what we've identified. What about going forward? What are the new tricks? What I'm going to tell you now is really just two examples of how I see things changing. They're, not, they're kind of representative. It's not the way it's going to be. This just happens to be two research efforts that we're undertaking which I think emphasize how things are starting to change. So let me just say about, a little about that. So here's actually a protein kinase, very similar to some of the ones that Mike Ribskoff put up yesterday. And basically, this ribbon representation has served us well for many, many years. So basically, the, collectively within that, that representation is a large body of knowledge that comes from the literature associated with mutation sites, the, uh, the, the actual action of the phosphorylation, and so forth, the type of substrate binding. So we can't neglect the value of that, but I would try and argue that it also has locked us into a certain way of thinking about molecules. So if you think about how one molecule, one protein molecule sees another one, it doesn't see a, pro it doesn't see, uh, a ribbon diagram. It sees something completely different. It's a whole morass of different physical characteristics, uh, as well as something that's moving, uh, and perhaps in different parts at variable rates. So we really need to start thinking differently uh, and embodying that in some of these resources, I would argue. So effectively, so just to give the Cartesian viewpoint, you could argue that it's a sort of local viewpoint. It doesn't necessarily capture the global properties of a protein. And that there are different mathematical uh, ways of actually describing this limitation. I won't go into that. But ultimately, that basically then leads to uh, limits in, in the way, for example, that you can pair molecules. So I'm going to illustrate this with just one, a couple of examples. So here's a different view of the same protein kinase you've seen before. And this is what we call the open book form. So basically, it takes the two lobes of the kinase, uh, which for, uh, for example, by uh, Kath and Scott are actually uh, considered differently in terms of whether they're one or two domains. Itself a sort of interesting question. But basically, by opening that molecule up, you're actually looking down on these two faces here uh, that in, into the... I oh, seem to get the mouse, sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, of, of where the ATP binds. So basically, if you take that, what you find, and you look across all members of the superfamily, but basically, there's quite a lot of differences. That you basically have the ATP binding cassette at the top here, in two cases having ATP bound, one not, which are somewhat similar, um, but still have some differences. And then you have the predominantly substrate binding area, which is clearly uh, quite different on first glance. But when you start looking into this, what you find is similarities that you wouldn't see otherwise. So, for example, the hydrogen bonding network between members of families, which are quite different in terms of, say, their topology, 
those hydrogen bonding networks are still conserved. So there's, there's levels of conservation uh, and difference that are not particularly well reflected uh, in the Cartesian coordinates directly. So you could take that a step further. So what I have on the left-hand side here is essentially a comparison of 31 members uh, in, the, in the kinase, protein kinase-like superfamily, which have been compared to each other and sort of represented in a heat-like map. And you can see that there's the details are not important. But basically what's going on here, and this is, these are two, these are compared using a, a standard structure comparison algorithm. And so what you see is that you get these kinds of things, but these are actually all, it's not shown here, and you'll see it in a minute, but these, whoops, these are actually organized into uh, families, and the darker block on the, uh, on the outside are actually the atypicals. So there is some degree of separation that comes from basic structure, Cartesian-based structure comparison. But what you also have on the right-hand side is what I call, uh, or what we call the uh, violations in the triangular uh, inequality. So basically, each of the points on the right, oh dear, each of the points on the right-hand side um, represent uh, deviations from the uh, inequality. So in other words, you can see by the equation at the top there, essentially it's each square again represents a comparison between two structures. And each of the other 30 structures that are in this list, uh, when they're compared, and they should have some measure of comparison, at least because they have comparison from a biological perspective, show violations in the inequality. In other words, they're not perceived by the algorithm as being equal. So you can actually begin to actually look at structure in a different way. And one way uh, is a multipole representation. I'm not going into the details of this. You can read about it in the paper if you're interested. But it has its roots in spherical harmonics. And it's been used. This is not something that uh, we invented. It's been used, and it's been used in physics for a long time, obviously. But it's been used in biology as well, with some measuring degrees of success. And so essentially, by defining a parameter space and a boundary condition, uh, you can operate on a, bio, uh, on a number of properties. And the, the order of the multipoles essentially gives you the granularity of the descriptors. The bottom line, and the details are not important here, this, it can be interpreted as a shape descriptor. So in other words, you're actually now considering molecules in a different way. You're considering them in terms of their shape, where those shapes are not at least derived directly from the Cartesian coordinates. When you do something like that, and here's that example of that same map from the same structures, uh, you, you actually get better discrimination. I wouldn't say this is necessarily going to work very well in all cases. The point is, is just that we should be thinking out of the box and differently about how we're representing proteins. So that's one example. And you can even take this so far as to actually use the shape of these molecules to try and build phylogenetic trees. And indeed, uh, this, the work on the left comes from a, a, an analysis, a structure-based analysis of the evolution of the protein kinase-like superfamily. And the tree on the right represents one you get from multipoles. And in fact, there are uh, some significant similarities. So maybe there's some possibilities there. But it's certainly, uh, we're looking into that further. So that's one example of thinking differently. Let me give you another example. And Joel Sussman touched on this in the concepts of disorder. So basically, we have structures that, and he pointed this out nicely, that go from an order to a disordered state. However, what there is, is there are large parts of structures that are in between. So it's basically a spectrum. It's not a binary distribution. So how do we deal with that? And one way of dealing with that is uh, essentially using, for example, a Gaussian network model. Again, not a new concept, but being used now by uh, an increasing number of us. And I won't go into the details of all of this, but essentially you can think of it a sort of a set of springs that are connected together, which is sort of what's depicted on the, the right-hand side there. And basically, you're actually uh, looking at local entropies. And so if you actually start pushing on one of the springs, it's going to have different effects in different parts of the molecule. It'll have local effects and also have long-range effects. And you can actually use this to um, essentially uh, decompose uh, and look at different modes of, of vibration and so on. And what you get out of it is something like this. And you can actually then normalize it. So you normalize these fluctuations uh, against some known cases. And basically, you can define arbitrary, empirically, minimum, maximum values for this. 
And from that, you can say anything outside of that represents something that's functionally flexible. So in other words, one assumes that outside of these boundaries, it has some functional role. And when you apply this to a couple of test cases in an example here, the top, the graph label A is the important one here. There's two parts to this. What you see is these modes of motion are actually different than one would see from the dotted line, which is from the B factors from the X-ray experiment. So basically, those also represent motion, but they represent very localized motion. And there are cases where you actually have uh, much longer range interactions, for example, as you would have in allosteric interactions. So you can begin to look at these things in a different way. And so you can, in the case of HRV1 uh, protease, you can see uh, larger motions in the flat region, uh, as you would expect, but also some other regions uh, out on the periphery, which are now uh, being targeted by various drugs. So this is an example um, of how you could use that. Here's the classic, just to focus on the bottom example of calmodulin. You can basically see that it picks up uh, the dotted line there is actually not the B factor, it's something else. So uh, you can see that you actually pick up the kind of motion, the very unusual motioning of the un un turning of the helix and the folding of that, um, that particular molecule. So you, you see some interesting things. Again, just a tantalizing view into what perhaps could emerge as an alternative way of thinking about proteins. I'll just say as a, an aside that, you know, you can do some of this, of course, in molecular dynamics. Uh, however, the Gaussian network model has uh, pluses and minuses. It's coarse-grained, uh, but it's actually relatively fast. So it's suitable for high throughput types of processing. So these are the sorts of new ways that we should be thinking about proteins uh, and ultimately, through consensus of community, inducting these kinds of things into our uh, resources. And I'll just point out that I think it's very important that these kinds of things don't come to attention unless there's an active research program that goes on around the resource. And clearly that, uh, that uh, by the people who maintain the resource as well, of course, as everybody else. Uh, and that's clearly a feature uh, of many of the activities that we're all involved in. So let me then just move from that to the notion of virtual communities quickly. So I think this is going to be a stunningly important thing. My metric of things like MySpace that essentially went from zero and in one year to 44 million users and now to over 90 million users, where the next generations of users of our resources are going to be very comfortable interacting through the notion, through the idea of a virtual community. And our resources should be these virtual communities whereby they can interact with the data itself or the results of that data, but they can also interact with each other. Uh, in, in new and exciting ways. And currently, we've sort of got two kinds of virtual communities going. The internal one, which we call, which is all, all the people involved in the WWPDB, and then the external one. So let me say a little about that. Uh, Janet touched on uh, the WWPDB, and I think this is a very important uh, activity. What it ensures to the community of users is that there will always be a unified archive of structural information. However, and then Rolf said this very nicely at one point, that basically it allows people to compete. Their ideas are competitive, but the implementation of those ideas are collaborative. And that's a very important thing, and that's sort of the same notion that goes on within the WWPDB. People come to this with different ideas, and basically a consensus finally arises, and, those are, uh, those, and so you get that wealth of ideas, but at the same time, you then uh, go and implement the best of those ideas. And that's being done uh, currently in two ways. One, through a remediation project, which is going back and taking all the uh, early structural information and addressing issues associated with ligands, for example, getting the correct stereochemistry, literature references, and taxonomy. And then the, net, the project that's just starting now is to, develop, is to build a universal uh, data processing system because at the moment, there are two systems that are aging, which are actually uh, used by different groups. So that will help the unification. Okay, so what about external? So as I said already, it's a gathering point for virtual communities, is how we're looking at this. And as I mentioned, we've identified different communities. Obviously, got, we don't do everything in the virtual way, but just a couple of examples I'll focus on. The RCSB PDB has a, a traveling art exhibit which actually goes to, it's been 
in various places around the US and Europe where it's an opportunity for people to go and look at structure from a different perspective, from an artistic perspective. And there's, there are people who have discussions around that, which is uh, an example of a virtual community. Increasingly, and I think this is part, all these resources, SwissProp, PDB, these others, we're all evolving constantly. And at this point in our evolution, it's become important and that outreach and working with these virtual and real communities is something that's now become a very important activity. And so doing various kinds of things with all age groups, high school students, undergraduates, uh, and working with molecules is so important. Then there's the virtual ways of doing this through uh, you know, Molecule of the Month, which goes on EBI and RCSB, where basically particular molecules are highlighted and there's a, a level of information. And then there's the glitzy stuff, like the immersive environments. We have an immersive environment at UCSD where I would say at this point has not brought forth any new and exciting research results. But what it has done is it's excited enormous numbers of people to the joys of protein structure that would not have otherwise had the experience. Right now this is a one wall cave, which means you face a wall and you have a, head, a motion headset so when you move your head the molecule moves, you have virtual pointers and dials and all these sorts of things attached to gloves on your hands and you can do all this sort of stuff. Eventually it will be a six wall uh, room that's, that's actually hanging in another room and the big room has all these projectors and it projects onto, these six, onto the six walls so you're basically standing in the middle of the molecule. And uh, it's not saying it's going to be you know, good for research purposes, although I can see that for very large complexes it might have some value, but my goodness it really excites people to the joys of protein structure. So let me just give you an example of how we work with other virtual communities. So the modelers, uh, Torsten went over this very nicely, but one of the ways we work is uh, through workshops with these different communities. So obviously in a physical sense then, and then going on virtually after that. So the number of the people in this room were actually at a workshop where we actually do, we actually deal, one minute, no minutes, no minutes, okay, where we deal with um, uh, the modeling aspect. So the decisions that have come out of this workshop are that the PDB will not, only, not accept models, only things in going forward, only things that have something, there are gray areas in this, but in terms of experimental measurements. But then, of course, there needs to be a public archive, uh, and it was uh, agreed that, of course, and Torsten pointed this out, that there must be ways of assessing the quality. Now, these are recommendations. What will happen from them remains to be seen. This will be published in structure if you want to read more. Okay, very quickly, in one minute, what will the resource look like in two to five years? So let me just focus on a couple of things. Part of dealing with different communities is the notion of my PDB. So one of the things we're actively working on now is to give each of those communities I highlighted a different view of the PDB. So when they come to the PDB, you can select your community type, and how you interact with the PDB might be different. Um, the notion of PDB in a box, which is a distribution of the complete PDB system, uh, we're doing that now in a beta stage, and anyone who's interested in that can have it. It's all open source and then new types of visualization tools. I'm going to take 30 seconds to cover another area which I think is so important, and it's been pointed out, and we've had actually some very interesting lectures on this uh, during this meeting. And the question is, is the database really different than the biological journal? And I'd say, in many ways, the answer is no. And in reflection of that, we've just been gun uh, assigning digital object identifiers, which get assigned to papers uh, right now in pretty much every journal, two structures. And you can begin to imagine what that's going to look like in the future. So I come to a paper in number one there. I actually see a figure in the paper. But looking at a structure-function relationship with respect to the figure is useful, but also limiting. I want to be able to click on that figure and immediately bring up a renderable and changeable version of that figure that's in the paper. To do that in a way the where that figure is identical in rendered mode as it is in static flat mode on the, in the paper, I need metadata stored with that image. All this can be done in an open access uh, an electronic environment. Then I'm looking at the molecule in two and I see certain features, so I actually highlight features on the molecule. That then brings up a composite set of information. For example, I'm interested in glycine-rich loops. It's then gone both to the literature 
and to the database, and it's brought up a collection of information that from both of those sources, which are currently fairly disparate now, about uh, glycine-rich loops as an example. That then points me to other papers of interest, and the circle is complete. So we've heard talks that address this. This is a sort of specific example with respect to structure. And I'm very excited about what that's going to bring forward. So let me just then end by acknowledging everyone uh, in the PDB team, and also Jenny Gu, who uh, did the dynamics work, the protein motions, the Gaussian network model, and Apostle Gramada, who's actually a physicist who's working on the uh, multipole representation of protein structure. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for one or two questions. All right. Thank you. J just a, a very general question. You, you, you've been talking about communities. Do we have any idea of the rough size of the community of biologists who need to access Swiss Broad, PDB, PFAM worldwide? Uh, one million, five million, uh, very rough. Um, I don't have a good feel for that. I mean, we've tried, and getting metrics for that is actually quite hard, as you can imagine. So we've done surveys, Wisprot does survey, every, people, various groups do surveys, and it's not clear that those are truly representative. There's, because there's always, I'm always concerned that there's a silent majority in a lot of these things. Because you hear it when you go, mainly people complaining when you go to various places and they realize you're associated with a resource, they, all this stuff comes out. It wouldn't, you, know, you never even knew they were a user of the resource. I mean, we get, it's, we get everyone from Nobel laureates to you know, kids 10 or 12 years old who send things into the info desk. You know, and it turns out that usually the 10 or 12 years old, of course, are better using the PDB than the Nobel laureates, but that's another story. Um, so we don't really have the, the kind of feel that we, 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 we should have. But um, what is clear is when we introduced the new version of the RCSB PDB this January, our usage statistics have gone from 120,000 users, indiv individual users a month to 180,000. And I, I cannot explain that, and the web logs are not really good enough to explain that. So basically, you know, I, I would attribute to it to hopefully bringing new people to the resource because there are more things for them to do that are easy to do. But I don't really know. Let's thank Phil Byrne again.